Welcome to the Presbyterian Church in Caddis, Ohio. We believe the Presbyterian Church of Caddis exists to share our faith in Jesus Christ with family, friends, and neighbors through our outreach and mission, worship and spirituality, fellowship, and communication. Reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. They were on the road, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, 
You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I eat and baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, They began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And may God speak to us through these verses today. <clears throat> you don't know what you're asking, Jesus tells James and John. They have just requested to be seated at his right and left hands when he comes into his glory. In fact, they come in secret with this request so that the other disciples don't know what they're up to. James and John probably figured that Jesus will eventually appoint someone to these top positions, so they decide to play a little power politics. They try to elbow their way to the top ahead of the others. And they're pretty bold about it, too. When they approach Jesus, they say, we want you to do whatever we ask. They want Jesus to say yes before they even tell him what it is they're asking for. And Jesus reacts the way most of us probably would. He doesn't agree to anything until he finds out what it is they want. And when he hears their request, he tells them that they don't know what they're really asking for. Now, for one thing, it's a pretty selfish and conceited request. James and John are asking to be placed higher than the other disciples, in charge over them. And why do these two brothers assume they're more deserving? But beneath all that, Jesus realizes they also have a deep misunderstanding of who he is and what he's really doing. For some reason... It seems that James and John may still be under the impression that Jesus is going to become some sort of king. That's what many people believed about the Messiah. The traditional belief was that the Messiah was someone chosen by God to deliver Israel from suffering and oppression by their enemies and then rule the nation for God. In the time of Jesus, Israel had been conquered and occupied by the Roman Empire They installed a weak and corrupt king on the throne as a puppet ruler. So if Jesus was the Messiah, as the disciples and many other people believed, then one of the things they expected was for him to go into the capital city of Jerusalem, overturn the king, drive out the Romans, and put himself on the throne with the disciples as his high-ranking cabinet, of course. This is what some of them still believe and expect about Jesus, not just James and John, in spite of the fact that Jesus was obviously not that kind of Messiah. That was not his ambition. His closest friends who had been with him for quite some time now should have known better, but still aren't getting it. Jesus was headed for Jerusalem, yes, But on three separate occasions in Mark's gospel, he tells his disciples that when he gets there, he will be rejected and humiliated. He will suffer and he will die at the hands of the authorities. The first time he predicts this, Peter argues with him and promises they won't let that happen, hinting that they will use force to protect Jesus. And Jesus reprimands Peter, telling him that his mind is not on the things of God. The second time he predicts this, the disciples don't seem to pay any attention, but they start arguing about which of them is the greatest. And now after this third prediction, James and John try to make a grab for positions of power and honor. 
You don't know what you're asking, says Jesus. And they don't know because they haven't been listening. They have not understood. Because in Jerusalem, Jesus will not wear a crown of gold. He will wear a crown of thorns. He will not step up to a throne. He will be hauled up on a cross. And the glory that he will enter is not the glory of majesty and might, but the glory of humility and self-sacrifice. Now that is what James and John are asking for, although they don't realize it. That's why Jesus asked them, Can you drink from the cup I drink from, be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? He seems to be asking if they are willing and ready to go through what he is about to go through. And they say yes. But again, if they are mistaken about what Jesus is doing, they're probably mistaken about how he will do it or what it will demand of them to be part of it. My guess is that they think they are volunteering to fight with Jesus, to fight for Jesus, that they think this might be difficult and dangerous, but in the end they'll win because after all, he's the Messiah, right? But what Jesus is really asking them is, are you willing to turn away from the ways of this world? Are you willing to reject the ways of kings and empires? Are you willing to reject the ways of power and privilege? Are you willing to drink the cup of self-sacrificing love, the giving of your lives for others? Now, Jesus had already died to the ways of this world, and he had been giving his life for others for years, which surely strengthened him to face what he knew waited for him in Jerusalem. But James and John, it seems that their little power play shows they're really not ready. They're not even really on the same page as Jesus. And maybe none of the disciples were, because when the other ten find out what these two brothers are up to, they get angry and maybe even fearful that they might be losing out somehow. So Jesus has to teach them all a lesson, and he uses the Roman rulers occupying their nation as an example, an example of what the desire for greatness and glory tends to do to people. Their rulers lord it over them, he says, and their great ones are tyrants over them. He's warning the disciples that a hunger for power could turn them into the very thing they are against. Tyrants who abuse their power and do more harm than good. Because Jesus is not interested in simply trading one group of privileged leaders for another. That wouldn't change anything. Because the real problem is that we human beings tend to set up power structures that wind up putting some folks up on the top and some folks down on the bottom. These are the power structures, whether they're political or economic or religious. These are what are responsible for human suffering in this world because they create inequality and conflict. These are the power structures that Jesus devotes his life to tearing down, to bring an end to conflict and suffering. And one of the ways he does this is by redefining greatness and glory. It is not that way for you, he reminds the disciples. True greatness, he says, is being a servant. And the only way to be number one is to become the slave of everyone else. Servants were very low on the social and economic scale. Slaves were the lowest. Slaves did the work that no one else would do, not even a servant. And they received the least reward, which was usually no reward. Jesus is using servants and slaves as examples of the opposites of kings and rulers, the opposite of what his followers are hoping and even scheming to be. Now, you may be familiar with the phrase upward mobility. Upward mobility means climbing the ladder 
of status and success as high as we can go. It's the model that our modern American culture is built on. But what Jesus is talking about is what we might call downward mobility. Giving up our own self-importance and embracing the importance of others. Striving less for our own comfort and benefit and more for the comfort and benefit of others. Serving each other instead of just serving ourselves. This is Jesus' model for real success, real greatness. In fact, he himself is that model. You know, Jesus had no royal ambition. He had no desire for a life of fame and luxury and fortune. Instead, he says, I am here to serve, not to be served. And I am here to give my life for many. And again, he's not simply referring to his impending death but to years of giving his life in loving service to others, service to many, and not just a favored few. Service not just to nice, clean-cut folks with good reputations, either. No, he gave more of himself to the sinners and folks rejected by society who get shoved down to the bottom. For Jesus, this is what it means to be a Messiah. This is how you save the world. Not by force and not by schemes to control others, but by taking care of each other, helping each other, and even, yes, suffering for each other out of love and compassion. And this is what his disciples, this is what any of us who call ourselves his followers are supposed to imitate. It is what the world is supposed to imitate because it is God's purpose for this world. That is what God intends this life to be for all of us. And we, as followers of Jesus Christ, are called to be examples of that kind of life. And sadly, the church has not always accepted that call. Too often, the church has instead pursued power and privilege. Like other religions, the history of Christianity is often filled with religious tyrants and so-called holy wars of conquest and exploitation. And even today, we hear too many stories of everything from Christians who believe that Jesus came and died to make us all rich and famous, to stories of churches that are ruled by iron-fisted pastors or a few influential members who are more interested in control than in ministry. And too often, we Christians are guilty of believing that we, like James and John, are somehow entitled to special treatment from God, that we have earned some sort of advantage over other people. And this can lead us to think that we are somehow better than these others or more deserving of God's love. We may even imagine that we deserve to be immune to the pains and problems of life that everyone else suffers just because we're Christians. And what happens when we discover that we are not immune to those things? You don't know what you're asking, Jesus tells James and John, when they come seeking places of honor and privilege at his right and left hands. And they really don't know. They certainly don't know, as one writer reminds us, that in all the Gospels, there is only one other reference to anyone winding up to the left and right of Jesus, and it is not a pair of ambitious disciples. It's a couple of outcasts, a couple of sinners. It's the two criminals who were crucified on crosses with Jesus. That is who Jesus was closest to in his moment of greatest sacrifice, his moment of greatest glory. You don't know what you're asking. And perhaps in some sense, Jesus says that to each of us who asks to become one of his followers, who asks to call ourselves by his name. Because more than once, he advises would-be followers to think twice, to count the cost. Because what we are really asking for is not a life of praise or preferential treatment, but a life of humble service. 
and not just to nice, respectable people either. They're easy to love, right? They're easy to care for. But we are called especially to service to those who have been forced down to the bottom, the people that the rest of the world turns its back on, the people it may sometimes seem a lot harder to love. What we are really asking for is not personal gain or glory, but the opportunity to give what we have and what we are to each other, to the greater good of everyone. What we are really asking for is to die to the ways of this world that create conflict and inequality, to die to the ways of the false greatness of status, wealth, and fame that this world values so much. To become a follower of Jesus Christ is to ask for our own cross. My friends, God's desire is for a world full of servants, not a world full of people stepping all over each other to get to places of honor. But the wonderful thing, the wonderful thing, though, is that in a world where everyone is serving each other, then everyone gets served. Everyone would be cared for, and we would all receive what we need. And isn't that the kind of world we really want? Or at least the kind of world that we should want, the world that our faith inspires us to want. In the meantime, we are called to live as if that kind of world exists here and now, because that is how we help to bring it into existence. I was watching a television show recently and one of the characters was explaining to his son why he kept trying to do some good in the world even though it seemed like such an uphill battle, even though it sometimes seemed like such a hopeless cause, a hopeless cause that didn't make much difference. And he said to his son, it doesn't matter if we don't make a difference. We live as though the world were as it should be to show the world what it can be. And I think Jesus would agree with that. I think it's what Jesus did with his own life and what he hopes we will all try to do with ours. Amen.